Well, I've been at a lot of events in this room, but that is the warmest welcome I think <laughs> Frank Doyle has ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, this is not too subtle. I, I'm very pleased to welcome my college classmate, Bill Gates. And I just want to say a word or two about Bill. The first I ever heard about Bill was when we were freshmen. And a friend of mine, another classmate, told me, keep an eye, keep an eye out for Bill Gates. He's going to do some really amazing things. And this classmate was pretty impressive himself, uh, somebody who I expected great things of. And I dare say that none of us could have predicted the great things that Bill would do. When I was a, uh, an undergraduate, when Bill and I were undergraduates, you have to understand that the world, especially when it came to computation, looked very different. To the best of my knowledge, and Bill may correct me about this, the only computer on Harvard campus was in the Science Center. Now, I was a research assistant as an undergrad, and I would work in a, at a building that was uh, on Cambridge Street, where CGIS North is today, and I would cross the street to go to the Harvard Computer Center, where CGI CGIS South is today, where I would run jobs. There wasn't actually a computer there. The computer was at MIT, so we were just connected to the mainframe at MIT. And in those days, the greatest anxiety that anybody could have in a job like mine was to drop the box of punch cards. Because if you did that, you would lose maybe a week's worth of work. Bill had a vision, and I understand it went back even then, that computing would be ubiquitous. It would be part of all of our lives. And indeed, as you all know, he executed on that vision. And the world today has changed so dramatically, in large part, due to the work that Bill has done throughout the years. So indeed, he has changed the world. He has done amazing things in technology. But arguably, he has done even more in, if you want to call it that, his second career as a philanthropist. Bill has an incisive, analytic mind. He, dem he demands rigor. He relies on data and he looks at outcomes. If any of us reflect for a little bit about the good things that we try to do, the altruistic acts that we engage in, we have to admit that from time to time, we wonder whether we're doing it more to make ourselves feel good about doing the right thing, or whether we're actually helping the people we want to help. Bill has removed all doubt about helping other people because he measures and the effects of his philanthropy has sim have simply been profound. Today, the New England Journal of Medicine published an article. Uh, I kid you not, the name of the study is Mordor. But uh, a study about the use of some very simple antibiotics given twice a year to preschool children in three countries in Africa. And on average, it reduced childhood mortality by 13%. And what's even more encouraging, the effects were larger in Niger, which had the greatest infant, uh, childhood mortality rates. This is a cheap, easy to implement intervention. And this work was sponsored by the Gates Foundation. There is example after example of the work that Bill and the Gates and Melinda and the Gates Foundation have supported over the years that have transformed health and maybe not as much as Bill would like, as we just heard from him, education as well. Few people in history have had as profound an impact on mortality and on human well-being as Bill has. And I dare say that none of us will know the full impact during our lives. The work that he has done will pay off for many, many years. So to close, let me just say, my friend, uh, whose name, as Bill probably knows, is Steve Ballmer. 
uh, he's not always right, but he's often right. And in this case, he was right, but he probably had no idea how right he would be when he said, Bill will do amazing things. So Bill, thank you for the amazing things you do. Thank you for the inspiration. And we all look forward to your dialogue with Frank. Please welcome again, Bill Gates. Bill, it's terrific to welcome you back here to Harvard. I'm hoping you can explain this uh, piece of paper that's uh, projected up on the screen here. Break the ice. Uh, well, I took a course called Act 2010 uh, that uh, was a Mike Spence taught on microeconomics. Uh, and that's part of my final. Uh, I, my whole thing was that I didn't want to attend any of the courses I was signed up for. And I had all these other courses that I attended. Uh, and so I remember when I went into that final, everybody was in my study group was kind of mad at me because like, hey, you never showed up. What, you know, now all of a sudden here you are. Uh, but it was an amazing course. Uh, the people who majored in economics uh, were at a disadvantage because knowing math was very helpful uh, in that, that course. But it was uh, fantastic. For the people in the back, I don't know if you can read it. Uh, the instructor's little comment in the lower corner there says, arithmetic error, no sweat. <laughs> well, Bill, we just had a really fun hour and a half, two hours with the robotics folks uh, in the engineering school here, touring various labs. And I'm wondering if you would share with this community your impressions of what you saw happening in robotics and the implications of that technology for humans, the impact, good, bad, and otherwise. Well, robotics is a, a very broad field at a very early stage, and there's some exciting and promising things that are come out of it. Normally when we think of it, we think of a human-sized, sort of a lot of metal type uh, contraption that's doing things humans would do, like cleaning up a room uh, or, or being an infantry soldier or some sort of manufacturing job. The work here is taking robotics in, in many dimensions into different realms. Uh, so I saw the robot B, which is a tiny little B-sized robot that can fly around. Uh, you know, it doesn't quite uh, go anywhere Autonomous yet, thing, but yeah. it's a, uh, I'm sure they'll get that figured out. I also saw a lot of what they called soft robotics, where instead of having uh, metal parts, uh, you have actually fabric and either through hydraulics or pneumatics, uh, you're manipulating this, uh, you know, I wore a glove that the air pressure pneumatically would uh, provide gripping. And so it's both thinking of enhancing humans who have normal functionality and taking people who say have had a stroke or ALS and, and allowing them to do normal functions uh, despite that disability. And so, Robotics is very cool because it's a lot of the sciences. There, yes, there's some good software that's in it, but actually looking at evolution, how do insects fly, you know, understanding Reynolds numbers and uh, turbulence and how you model that, which at small scale, it's amazing. Nobody really understands how insects fly. Uh, slowly but surely, we're uh, figuring it out. So I saw a variety of uh, robots that are, are really amazing. Uh, and of course, nowadays people share their latest ideas, so the, the collaboration between the various teams was amazing to see. Terrific. Well, you know, as I was preparing for this, I went back and I found one of your uh, former professors who's still on the faculty, uh, Harry Lewis uh, in computer science, to try to get some insight into your character uh, back in the day when the picture we saw earlier was uh, a reflection. Um, and one of the things Harry recalled was you had this voracious appetite for reading. You had this immense capacity for learning, a, a sense of curiosity that as we've watched your career, doesn't seem to have narrowed any. And especially as we think about in Alan's introduction, the, the array of topics that your foundation touches on that you have expertise and knowledge in from public health to education reform to renewable energy. How is it that where many of us who get to a certain level in our career dive deep and narrow and specialize, you've managed to not narrow and keep your curiosity very, very broad. Yeah, certainly during the time I was at Harvard, 
I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, the idea that software was this field that uh, was the opportunity was unbelievable. That became more obvious during the three-year period I was here. Uh, but my dad had been a lawyer. I thought of mathematics, you know, like doing well in the Putnam. That was the coolest thing. Uh, and the computer software, I didn't think those people were as smart as the math people. So it's like, well, am I going to go into the easy field uh, or this really hard field? But uh, anyway, math uh, was fantastic. When I finally picked and decided to go, go to Microsoft, then I got into a period from age uh, 19 uh, to about 40 where I wasn't able to look at the latest on, you know, how tornadoes work or how mitochondria work. I was pretty monomaniacal. And when I was able to ask Steve, this is the year 2000, Steve Ballmer, uh, he, he mistakenly graduated, uh, but then he started at Stan... Uh, <laughs> Well, I was trying to hire him, but his parents told him you're supposed to graduate, which was fine. But then he started at Stanford Business School, and he was in his first year, and I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'll get him to drop out of Stanford Business School. Uh, so in a certain sense, he is a dropout. Uh, uh, and he was very key to the success of Microsoft. I mean, uh, he knew a lot of things. But during that period, I didn't get to do much. At Harvard... You know, I took all these courses because it was just so amazing that people were interested in talking about them. And uh, I, I have to say, I never went to a lecture during reading period or any, anything because the courses that I was actually signed up for, I finally started to work on those. Uh, so I was in Hillel the minute it would open to the minute it would close during reading period trying to catch up on, on that other set of courses. So people say I'm a dropout, which is literally true. But because I like college courses, the online college courses, there's a company called The Learning Company that I buy uh, tons and tons of their stuff. And I do you know, at least four or five courses a year. In a sense, I like uh, going to college more than anyone. Uh, so you know, I've sort of made sure my job, certainly post Microsoft, uh, that I get to spend my time meeting with scientists, uh, learning new things, you know, seeing what the hard problems are, in some cases giving money to people to take on uh, those very, very hard problems. So knowing you have such a passion for education reform and you touched on MOOCs, what's your vision of how MOOCs will or will not transform education? There have been a lot of prophecies about the doom of universities as we know it, and that mercifully has not come to pass. But what are your thoughts about where MOOCs are going to fit in, whether at the K-12 through level or at the, uh, the higher level? Well. Education is essentially a social construct. It's not that the universities have secret knowledge that only they have available. Uh, you know, I took, <laughs> these numbers won't make any sense anymore, but the hardest freshman math class was called Math 55. Uh, <laughs> I assume it's not called that anymore. Uh, but it was, it was a group of eight. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was a group of 80 people whose personal positioning was they were the best person at math that they had ever met. So there were 79 frauds, uh, one person who really was the, the best at math. I ended up, the guy who came in first in the class is a lawyer in New York now. Uh, the guy who came in second is a professor of chaos theory at uh, Princeton. Uh, and then I came in third. Uh, so I knew, okay, math, geez, uh, that's interesting. Anyway. Uh, I didn't take Physics uh, 55, but I read the Feynman book. And so if you're motivated, seriously, you don't have to take a course. The Feynman book, if you're hardcore, just read the Feynman book, do the problems. You want to learn to do software? Read The Art of Computer Pro Programming. Good luck doing the problems. But uh, you know, anyone that's rated 30 or harder is like super hard to do. And so, a MOOC, in a sense, doesn't change what counts. Uh, you know, it's always been in the textbook, but the percentage of students who just buy textbooks and, and read them and know the subject is vanishingly small. You kind of have to have this thing where a bunch of kids all come at the same time, uh, and you know, if you don't study, you're going to get a bad grade, and your parents may not like that. Uh, you have to create all these social things 
in order for people to get into this mode of hyper concentrating and actually understanding why should I concentrate? You know, if I'm a high school student, they put X's and Y's up on the board. How does that relate to my life? Now, if you understood that being good at math lets you get a good job, travel the world, uh, you might say, okay, it does relate to me, but that's a very indirect thing and the kind of discipline to care about that, uh, to concentrate, that's what's missing. And so MOOCs, to the degree that it's easier to take a MOOC than it is to read a textbook, yeah, that's nice. It's a little bit interactive, there's a video. That's partly why I like the learning company, like all their economics, there's a guy named Timothy Taylor who has five courses on economics, I super recommend. Uh, and you learn to like him and his way of explaining things. So a MOOC is a slightly more digestible form of learning, but it doesn't take, particularly for somebody at a young age, it in no way changes this question of why should people uh, engage in that learning and how do you create the environment and the sense of achievement and the sense of capability that sitting in there and you know, looking at X's and Y's and manipulating them uh, seems like a, a smart thing to do. Yeah, terrific insights. Well, Bill, let me ask you to kind of reflect back to when you were the age of the folks in the room here, 20 or so, um, the, with the experience that you've accumulated since that time. We've got a bunch of incredibly smart, ambitious, creative folks in the room here who are going to be the future doers and makers and, and influencers. What advice would you impart based upon your recollection of when you were sitting in this seat at that age? Well, I think it's, if anything, a more interesting time to be lucky enough to be a student at Harvard. Uh, the ability to take innovation and solve problems, including the class of problems I'll call inequity problems. How do you uh, you know, help low-income students do as well as high-income students? How do you go to Africa and help the health and education take the incredible population growth that'll be there and make that a positive asset for that continent? These are very tough problems and, uh, you know, they've eluded uh, being solved. So obviously uh, the easy problems are not the ones you'll, you'll get to work on. So whether it's uh, you know, health costs or climate change or you know, robots that are, do good things uh, and not bad things uh, or the policies around those things, this is a fascinating time to be alive. Uh, you know, I don't know what it'll be like 50 or 60 years from now, what the problems will be, but in your generation, uh, you know, cancer, infectious disease, so many things will be solved and the societal framework of how you avoid polarization and how you maintain trust, uh, those things will also need some brilliant breakthroughs. Terrific, good, well I hope you're all inspired. <laughs> um, I could sit here and ask him questions all day, but we've got some really inquisitive folks out here in the audience who I know surely have some questions. Let me remind you of some of the, the Harvard ground rules here. Um, so first of all, introduce yourself, say what school or what concentration you're coming from. Second, keep your question brief. Third, make it a question. Something that ends with a question mark as opposed to a statement, okay? We've got some mic runners who are gonna go around and I'm gonna start with this person right here. If we could get a mic. Halfway up right at the aisle there, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Gates. Uh, so I'm a 3L uh, three at Harvard Law School. And uh, my name is David, I'm from China. So I also went to Universal Washington for my graduate study. I got my PhD there. So my question is, uh, so Universal Washington is a great public school and you also, you and uh, Mr. Paul Allen helped the school so much. And I, but it, to be honest, uh, for, in the US, the public schools have a hard time competing with uh, private schools, especially for undergraduate study. So I wonder how you, see this problem and is it, there going to be any change in the future? So that's my question. Thank you very much. Yeah, our foundation uh, has two things that we work on. One which is global in nature is improving health and we now complement that with agriculture and a few other things. And then here in the US, about 20% of what we do is US education. So we did a thing called the Millennium Scholarship, uh, which was 20,000. Uh, diverse kids who got uh, scholarships, 
but a lot of what we do is try to be the R&D funding. You can look at industry by industry, you know, pharmaceutical software, and say, okay, how much do they work on their next breakthrough? If you a priori thought, okay, what are the returns to society, you'd probably want education to have the highest R&D percentage. In fact, it effectively has a 0% R&D. Uh, you know, public schools don't do R&D. Department of Education essentially doesn't. There's a little bit of money. So we thought, okay, that's a market failure, a systems failure. We can go in, uh, and there's a professor here, Tom Kane, who we uh, supported a lot. He came to us early on and said, hey, there are some teachers who are super good, and if you could just move people, the average teacher, to be... Uh, at the boundary of the top quartile, then U.S. education would be as good as Singapore, which is uh, Singapore, Korean, and Shanghai are the three best in the world. And so that was very intriguing. So we went around and did 20,000 hours of video of the really good teachers, and then we did 20,000 hours of the other teachers, and compared and learned a lot about how good teachers interact uh, uh, they were way more interactive with their class uh, than the others. And we thought, okay, we'll put this online. People will watch this. They'll all learn how to teach like those people. Uh, well, so far we haven't uh, managed to move the, the needle on that in a big way. But, you know, we're working hard. There are very good schools, uh, you know, magnet schools that sort of cheat by picking their student body. Uh, there are charter schools that even in the inner city, uh, some of them, like KIPP, do extremely well. Uh, by creating a culture. And the cost of those schools is not uh, as high as the nearby public school, which can often have 50% type dropout rates. So at the micro level, it feels like we understand some tactics. Uh, some of the tactics involve the use of computers and software, but that may, that's less profound than you might think at the early grades because it's all about this motivational uh, uh, stuff and just computerizing it a little bit in math, you can uh, get to somebody's level and therefore they're feeling more positive feedback. So that, that is working, but that's not uh, the whole equation. So you know, education, we're spending 800 million a year and our goal, which was to move the average quality of, it, of US education up into that top three, we have no noticeable uh, impact uh, after almost uh, 20 years of working in that space. But we, we're committed, we're gonna keep, uh, keep doing it. Frustratingly inertial system, yeah. So there was a hand up here earlier, the young lady in the black uh, sweater there, black shirt. Hi, um, I'm Danica Gutierrez. I am a sophomore at the college studying economics and I am a Gates uh, Millennium Scholar. Oh, um, and oh, I man. just, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to personally thank you uh, for supporting my education and the ambitions of other students like me. And um, my question for you is, uh, what is something that you regret doing or maybe not doing while you were here at Harvard? Thank you. Um, well, I wish I'd been more sociable. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think they got rid of, there were these things called men's clubs. Uh, I think this, and I, I was so antisocial, I never would have even known they existed, but Steve uh, Palmer decided I needed to have some exposure to, I guess, drinking. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so he got me punched for the Fox Club, so I'd go to those uh, events, uh, and that, that was highly educational. Uh, <laughs> But I think they shut them down or something because they yeah, had, couldn't cure their... Sensitive subject. Uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not trying to... It's fine. Uh, uh, there's lots of places to drink. Um, so, you know, I wish I'd mixed around a bit more. Uh, you know, I, I just... Uh, it was a fun time, though, uh, because, you know, you had people around you could talk to 24 hours a day. And, uh, you know, the classes were so, so interesting and they fed you. Uh, I, I lived up a courier because you could get hamburger for every meal. Uh, you could have a hamburger for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. Uh, and the, the male-female ratio was one to one, which that was an unusual thing. Uh, 
at the time. It didn't help me, but it uh, uh, <laughs> was a visual improvement uh, uh, for me. Uh, so, you know, I wish I'd gotten to know more people. I was just so into being good at the classes and taking lots of, of, of classes. It, you know, it worked out in the end. Um, <laughs> but I missed a lot of, well, I never went to a football game or a basketball game or uh, whatever other sports teams Harvard <laughs> we, we might happen to have. Just a few, <laughs> right. So maybe from this side of the room this time, right over here. Hi, um, my name is Angelina Yi. I'm from Sycamore, Illinois, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, so as someone as famous and as like, has done so much in society, outside of your family, I was wondering what something, what is something that you're most proud of and you feel like is your biggest accomplishment? Well, it, in work, you know, the, the Microsoft work, I'm very proud of, the magic of software and how software is empowering people. You know, at the foundation, the fact that we took a field of helping, uh, you know, the poor countries, the developing countries, really uh, improve their health systems in a dramatic way. I'd say the statistic that I'd be most proud of is that when we got started, there were 11 million children a year under the age of five would die every year. And now that number uh, has been cut more than in half. So it's a little over 5 million now. And that's because we've gotten new vaccines and drugs out in uh, you know, India, Africa, all of these developing countries. And so you know, having it be uh, in half, that's, that's pretty amazing. And we did not expect to do that. Uh, I thought improving the US education system would be way easier than that. We're on a path by 2030 to cut it in half again. So it'll go uh, to less than two and a half million, which will mean that only at that point, uh, uh, only about 2% of children will die before the age of five, which that's pretty incredible because uh, for a variety of factors, it's hard even for a rich country to get much below 1%. So it means the risk of death in a poor country is only about a factor too higher. There are a few places left in the world where 15% of the kids die. Uh, that's sort of Central Africa, including Northern Nigeria. Historically, before medicine came along, that number was about 35%, no matter what your wealth was. But then as countries got richer, you got this huge gap, particularly because you had diseases like malaria that nobody, uh, once the rich world solved their malaria problem, then there was zero dollars going into it. There was no market incentive if it's only very poor people who have a disease. So, uh, and you know, so I hope that, so I feel good about where we are. I hope that we get polio done. We're very close. Uh, that would be a, a big day to have polio be fully eradicated. <laughs> and you know, then that would give the world the energy and hopefully uh, the commitment to go get malaria, which would be about a 20 year quest and requires a lot of uh, breakthroughs. You know, I'm also, you know, you know, trying to be a good parent, which is harder to measure. Am I twice as good a parent as I was 10 years ago? Uh, uh, or anything like that. But uh, I, I put a lot of effort in, into that. Fantastic. All right, how about um, in the middle and the back there? Yeah, the, exactly. Hi, my name is Shanti Scott Norman. I am an arts and education student at the Graduate School of Education. I'm a middle school art teacher, and I commend you for the work that you do in public education, and I'm curious to know about your thoughts on teacher pay, especially these days. I don't think, ed <laughs> I don't think education, public education is going to get much better if teachers don't get paid more. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, you know education in the U.S. 
the way K through 12 is funded is very different than the way higher education is funded. So let me just talk about the biggest part, which is the K through 12. The, we definitely want more resources to go into that sector, but at the state level, the trends unfortunately are not favorable because the amount of money that's raised at the state level uh, as a percentage of GDP is, is quite flat, often slightly down because they, they tax goods and not services and often fairly regressive. As you look at the demands on that resource pool, the pension costs, which have been fraudulently misaccounted, and the medical costs, which show up in the prison system, current employees, retired employees, and Medicaid, those are all going up very dramatically. And so unless a state is willing to increase its tax level, what happens is first they start cutting all the maintenance of everything, uh, then they start cutting the higher ed piece. And so you've seen state university tuitions uh, triple over the, the last decade. And then K through 12 is a priority, but so many states have cut so much that they're actually in some cases cutting it. And you've seen recently uh, some teacher strikes that came out of the fact that they uh, had, quote, reformed the tax system to have, not have enough money uh, to, to pay for K through 12. And so I'm hopeful that the percentage of GDP we put into the K through 12 system can go up, but it won't go up by a factor of two. You know, even if we raise taxes in an appropriate progressive way, uh, because of those other liabilities, if, if we were really smart, we'd put another 20 or 30 percent in, most of which would go to increase salaries so that uh, it's attractive to be in that profession. It is a profession that has an unusual salary structure that the younger teachers are uh, relatively paid less than they should anyway. Uh, and, you know, so step, this is all decided uh, state by state, and there's a factor of three variation uh, Massachusetts actually spends a lot of money on K through 12. I wouldn't suggest it needs to spend more, but uh, there's only about eight states that you can say that uh, for. The rest of them are at about 10,000 per student per year, and it's, it's, it's not enough. As these systems get squeezed right now, what they're doing is they're taking out a lot of elective activities, which have extremely high returns relative to the amount of money put into them. But, you know, all the music, after school, athletics, those things get squeezed. So the system actually is, when you see a funding cut, say you see a negative 4% cut, your image should be that that system is working 20% worse because they're not actually very rational about uh, how they do things. But you know, it's gonna be a political fight uh, because uh, you know, being pro-tax, uh, you know, not many people, you know, I've been fighting for the estate tax to be bigger and higher, you know, higher percentage. And it's a lonely thing to be a pro-tax uh, person, <laughs> especially amongst my pe say, quote, an outlier. peers. Uh, <laughs> uh, about the gentleman in the salmon-colored shirt there? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Jankowski, freshman here at the college studying applied math. I'm from California, San Francisco. I just wanted to ask you um, if you think there's a lack of scientific literacy in U.S. politics right now? Um, and if so, how do you go about tackling that challenge? Well, definitely there are several topics uh, like climate change or reducing medical costs uh, or uh, uh, using uh, the latest techniques to make food uh, productivity and nutrition better, so-called GMO techniques. The understanding of that is very limited, but it's not just the politicians. If you take an issue like GMOs and you ask the general public or you ask about you know, evolution, uh, so the electorate, um, the problem is when you get issues, climate change being maybe the best example, where the scientific understanding is fairly important because the sacrifices have to be made now in order to get the benefits later. Uh, you know, if you, if the effect of climate change, your neighbor, you know, you were seeing it today, uh, you would, uh, it would be politically different. Uh, HIV is like that where 
you get infected and you go almost eight years before you start to get sick. So motivating people to behave so they protect themselves, particularly in a very poor country where your time horizon that you think about trade-offs is much shorter than we would typically have. And you know, so yes, we, you know, in the same way that uh, uh, the women's movement is doing a great job of identifying candidates and they have more candidates who are gonna run for office uh, in this midterm election cycle than ever before, you know, there's other attributes like being good at managing things and understanding science. And we don't need, you know, half the politicians, but enough. And, you know, if they can specialize and push in those areas. So it's the anti-science that's a problem. It's not, uh, there was a book that was written called Physics for Future Presidents. Uh, and it's great, uh, you know, explains why fear of radiation is kind of insane and why getting rid of gasoline because it's so energy dense is, is a lot harder than we might think. Uh, so, you know, we, we need to push back. Right now we're sort of in a, a dip in terms of that science being an argument for good policies. So can I pick it up on that for a minute and just say, even with what was happening in Washington three weeks ago, four weeks ago with Mark Zuckerberg, the question of data privacy and technology, the kind of questions that are near and dear to your heart, again, seem to be something that um, is sorely lacking in understanding and experience in the Congress. How do we close that gap? I realize we're not going to train a bunch of computer scientists to, to be elected officers, but how can we bridge the divide between the current state of knowledge and what they really should know to do effective regulation? Well, the, the, there are some very cutting edge issues that even if I think, if we took this audience and say, okay, what do we think the solutions to these problems are, the ideas would be, you know, a hundred times better than asking the Congress. But the boundary, uh, least. even so though, the boundary between hate speech and free speech uh, is super complicated. The idea that people like to listen to things that, that, that are agreeable to them, even if they're not true, that reinforce their biases, and that society is becoming more polarized in terms of what we read, where we live, uh, and that digital tools are sort of the ultimate accelerator of this polarization. And so what do you do? Do you force people to see things they disagree with? You know, should Facebook sign up to the, hey, you know, 25% of articles will piss you off pledge, uh, uh, you know, so that we're reading the same headlines and that we can see that some of the facts uh, are, are not facts. I think it's, those are, are super tough uh, things. It was kind of nice for Mark that at least a few of the questions were, uh, malformed enough that you get a little bit of a break. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Refreshing way of looking at it. But if we swing back here, maybe down near the front with the HLS jacket. Can we get a mic right over down front in the middle here? Hi, my name is Lawrence David. I'm from Harvard Law School, LLM student from Canada. Um, so you've mentioned uh, a few issues that are currently plaguing American society, whether it's scientific illiteracy, uh, education, things of that nature. Um, I know your foundation f focuses a lot on uh, improving educational outcomes. Uh, what do you regard as the most significant challenge facing the United States today and moving forward in the coming uh, decades? Well, have you had Pick one, I'd say the quality of the education system. I mean, this is a country that has essentially a credo of equal opportunity more than anything else. And the only way you really execute equal opportunity is by having a, a great education system. There are a few other issues like staying out of wars would be a good thing. Uh, and making sure that uh, some negative events like a pandemic either naturally caused or from bioterrorism that were prepared for those things, which are fairly low probability things. So in no way, I'm, you know, tomorrow I give a thing called the Shattuck Lecture, which is about how we should get organized for pandemics. Uh, and it, it, it won't take, you know, 0.2% of society's resources to be more ready uh, for uh, those things. So overall, I'm quite optimistic. And my general framework 
is a very optimistic framework. Uh, you know, the, there's a book uh, by Hans Rolzing that just came out that I super recommend. It's called Factfulness, very easy to read, that kind of creates a framework, okay, of what problems have we solved and why, when asked questions about the state of the world, do people pick the wrong answers, not at a random level, but a way worse than random level? And actually, university professors were the worst group they polled. Uh, you know, so they'd say, like, what's happened to poverty in the last 25 years? It's you know, gone up, stayed the same, been cut in half. 4% of university professors picked the right number, which is kind of weird because you'd think they would have this notion of, okay, this country did it well, I've seen what Vietnam did, I've seen what China did. Their whole framework would be in the frame of how time uh, has improved things. So, you know, we have innovation on our side. The U.S. has one problem that it won't be as unique a country in the future, this 5% of people in terms of political power and scientific discovery won't be as much at the center as the other 95%, which is a good thing by uh, most ways of looking at it. But getting us used to the fact that we're in a multilateral world, particularly given current attitudes, is, is an adjustment problem. But education, if I had a wand, uh, if I had a wand for the world, I'd fix malnutrition, and a wand for the U.S., I'd, I'd fix education. Mm. How about the gentleman sitting right there yeah, on the, the ground? Yes, you. Can we get a mic right over here? Hello. I'm Michael Chang. I'm a junior at the college studying physics and electrical engineering. And my, I admire you because you did what you love, you seized the right opportunities, and you gave back to society when you succeeded. So my question for you is, besides dropping out of Harvard, <laughs> what, was, what were some of the best things that you did looking back, and <laughs> what at the time made you think of doing these things? Well, I've been you know, so lucky uh, in terms of my progression. You know, I had parents who read a lot and came and shared even at the dinner table like my dad was working on lawsuits and my mom was working on very social service type things and so i had an exposure to that and you know they gave me an arbitrary budget to buy books uh so i got to you know just just read a lot they sent me to a super nice school for high school then they sent me to a super nice school for college uh and you know they basically paid for it. Uh, so it, the idea that computers were going to be a change agent, you know, I was lucky enough to meet Paul Allen and early on we brainstormed about this idea of the chip and the chip changed the rules. I mean, most things don't get a million times better, not, you know, engine efficiency or, uh, you know, most things have uh, theoretical minimums. Computation is something that uh, we're not even close to the theoretical minimum, and yet we've improved so much. So seeing that that was going to come, and weirdly, that most people didn't see that was going to come. So you know, even people at IBM were still thinking in terms of big computers. You know, now all the the uh, software and service-driven companies are worth even more than IBM. When I was growing up, IBM was the monolith, and it was always, okay, are we going to beat them? Are we going to join them? Those bastards. <laughs> Actually, they were very nice people, but we always thought of them. Uh, and they, they sort of stood for these big computers that only big companies and governments could get the benefit for. So actually, we played off of that to have this power to the people, personal computing type thing. Of course, now we're a big company, uh, and somebody can play off of us. Uh, you know, it's hard to say what the ventures are. I mean, being able to concentrate on something in an extreme way, you know, is that nature, is it nurture? Uh, maintaining curiosity, a lot of people lose curiosity in their 20s or 30s, so if you hand them a big thick book, they're like, what, you know, am I gonna read that? I used to tell everybody to read Steven Pinker, but I think, it, which is, if, if you want to, it's, the, it's even as an intellectual framework, even better than Rosling. But I'm afraid you know, a lot of people don't make time to read what's a fairly academic and super profound, both uh, Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. And then, you know, I was born at a time where I can go out and learn all these things. 
And then I have friends, you know, if I'm trying to understand quantum computing, a lot of times I get confused. So it helps to have friends who can come and say, <laughs> try to straighten you out. And it makes your willingness to try to learn something. Uh, even trying to understand tornadoes, which are this funny 3D thing, uh, you know, having somebody could show me where the visualization was and, okay, what are the unique conditions. I don't think I would have done that if I didn't have a group of people that had stayed intellectually curious and that we had the internet to kind of feed us uh, access to the, the latest thing. So I think, you know, the time I was born, uh, you know, meeting Paul, seeing the microprocessor, the idea that a young person can start a company here is a, a super nice thing because although people at first are skeptical, as soon as they realize their normal model of what I knew and what I could do, that I didn't fit that normal model, then they assumed I knew way more than I did and I could solve all sorts of problems I had no clue uh, you know, how to solve. But you know, it was nice uh, that people were kind of agog that we had built this company and done these things from a young age. So I think the culture of America, that you know, almost the American dream type success story, uh, worked out. And then, you know, not being in Silicon Valley, but not being far from Silicon Valley, uh, that ended up, I think, working uh, for the company in a great way. About way in the back there. Gentlemen, yeah, right there. You still have your hand up. Yep, you. Yeah, if you want to have impact, uh, usually delegation is important. Uh, although, you know, individual contributors in terms of inventing a drug or a new approach to things, that's phenomenal. So when Microsoft first got started, I wrote most of the code, and everybody else's code I read and kind of rewrote. Uh, and <laughs> that got us up to 10 people. And then I had to say to myself, OK, we're well, going to ship code that I didn't edit. Uh, and that was hard for me. Uh, but, I, you know, I kind of got over that. Then I still said, okay, I'm going to interview everyone and I'm going to at least look at samples of their code. Well, that got us up to about 40 people. And that was at a point where I had sold way more software than we could write uh, because everybody was so impressed. And I thought, well, I need to keep enough, collect enough money to, you know, keep hiring all these people. But uh, the demand was so high that, you know, we were actually falling behind. That's when I hired Steve. And Steve figured out, A, uh, how to control what promises I made to people, uh, and B, how to hire lots of people, and good, really good people, and create organizations and teams. So I delegated to Steve that. And he was constantly saying to me, OK, we're going to hire programmers that you've never met. And I'd say, no, we're not. And then he, he would show me numerically that the constraint wasn't going to work. Uh, you know, so. Uh, then I said, OK, then I would you know, know all the managers of the people. And so over time, uh, and of course, you know, I could say the quality per person was falling monotonically, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> according to me. Uh, but you know, large problems, uh, if you want to you know, write the most popular uh, office productivity software, that one person absolutely can't do that. You can write pretty code. So everyone has to decide what scale of organization they want to work in. Eventually, you know, my role was very much as a leader and a reviewer of managers. But the top people, and I hired some super experienced people, uh, I would make sure they were pursuing a common vision and they were well coordinated. But in terms of a lot of management stuff, they were way better than I was. Now, I had to have the framework to know what mix of skills that we needed and you know, when they were working well enough together. But a lot of uh, you know, my value add of was picking, say, to do graphics user interface or to do an integrated office uh, type thing or to go global and not use agents to have Microsoft be present all over the world. And so yeah, picking what you're good at and how you find the other people 
uh, to fill in those things. That's super important. And most founders don't, aren't able to scale that up and kind of give up the hands-on things that they used to get a lot of uh, pleasure and comfort from. It's a careful balance. By the way, people are interested in seeing a piece of code. There's a piece of Bill's code from 1975 that adorns the wall in Maxwell Dworkin. So that is a great piece of code. <laughs> <laughs> How about over here in the, the red sweater, about halfway up? Yep. Um, hi, um, I'm Venting. I'm a PhD uh, student in chemistry. Um, and I really admire your, work, your effort in bringing, uh, improving the education overall. So I wonder what is your general parenting philosophy um, say if your daughter wants to drop out of college as well. <laughs> mm. Thank you. For example, if your daughter wanted to drop out of college. Well, she, my eldest graduates from Stanford in June, so I'm, I'm optimistic uh, <laughs> that she won't follow in my footsteps. Uh, the, there's a, a group of writings uh, that all come under the heading Love and Logic which is my philosophy of parenting. And it's basically a view that no matter what you say, your kid will look at how you deal with the world and they'll end up dealing with it like you do. And so if you're calm and predictable, you set rules, you enforce those rules in a non-emotional, very straightforward way, uh, then their whole sense of the world, the world is not chaotic, the world can be predictable. They, and if they you know, behave in certain fashions, it'll uh, work out that way. I was not raised that way, uh, so I decided, okay, this is how I'm uh, going to do it. And so far, so good. Um, I have to say I've delegated 80% of the, not delegated, but my wife does 80% of uh, <laughs> this. Uh, and she is way better parent than I am. She's not a perfect love and logic person. So every once in a while, a certain emotional will come into her tone that uh, she just looks at me and you know, she knows I'm like, hey, can you uh, get rid of the emotion? But so you can't totally do it. But th there's some brilliant books and online uh, courses about this. I think partnering was the word you were looking for. Yeah, right? absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> about right here, young lady. So can we get a mic over? Well, when I was in high school, I thought, hey, I'm a good student, uh, and therefore I should go be like a professor of mathematics. Uh, and those are the hardest problems to solve, and, uh, you know, I like hard problems, and, uh, you know, there's a certain purity to it. And then the computer came along, and it was actually uh, my original partner, Paul Allen, who said to me, oh, you think you're so smart, can you figure out this computer? And I was like, well, yes, I can. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was very, actually, then together, he and I uh, went on this journey that even when I was here at Harvard, uh, he got a job and was out here, and we were brainstorming, and then decided that because we saw in Harvard Square this first kit computer with a microprocessor, it was time to drop out and go really build Microsoft to be the first uh, in that business. So, you know, that idea of a, uh, being an academic to being a CEO, manager, leader type, that sort of developed over time. Even the idea that Microsoft would be a big company, I never would admit that to myself because I was always so into cost control that I always thought, okay, we'll double in size, but that's it. Uh, you know, I didn't want to get ahead of myself that I couldn't pay people someday because uh, we had a lot of customers that would go out of business and not pay us so that, you know, I didn't want to be, well, digital equipment is, and Wang are two companies I grew up, you know, thinking those were godlike companies and Wang went bankrupt fairly early on uh, even though they had great innovation and later DEC essentially goes bankrupt and that, that was the coolest company ever and boom, it's gone. 
Uh, so at least it, it does create a model that, hey, things are risky, you better not miss a, uh, a turn in the road. Then, you know, as Microsoft was becoming super successful, the idea of, okay, what am I going to do with this money? Um, you know, I could spend a little bit on myself, uh, you know, and I could give some to kids and, you know, make sure they got a good education, whatever. But as a percentage, even the maximum of those two outlets, you know, became tiny. And so then it was, okay, what do philanthropists do? And studying Rockefeller and uh, all sorts of people who've done all that stuff, I thought, oh, well, this is interesting. Are there research topics uh, that aren't getting enough money? And that's where I started to learn about global health and realized that, like malaria, nobody was putting any money into malaria. The U.S. Army historically had put money in because troops were exposed to malaria, but then they got these drugs, prophylactic drugs, like mefloquine, lorium, larium, uh, and so they didn't need to put any more money into it. And so our first 30 million, we became the biggest funder in a disease that kills a million children a year at that, at that time. We're down to 400,000 now. So it was a progression, uh, you know, meeting, working with Paul Allen in high school, working with Steve Ballmer at Microsoft, then meeting and marrying Melinda. Each of those, you know, were very, very important in getting my mind you know, shaping uh, whatever abilities I have towards something worthwhile. Terrific. Well, I know the hour is almost up. We've got time for one more question. How about the gentleman here in the white shirt? Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Bill, for coming. Um, I really appreciated your letter to. Um... The annual letter? I literally forgot the name. Okay. Um, well, anyway, my name is Jerry. I'm a freshman at the college uh, studying stem cell biology. And uh, my question to you is, if you suddenly found yourself to be, uh, say, a sophomore in college at Harvard, what do you think you would uh, study, and how do you think you'd uh, spend your time engaging in activities? Well, the thing that you're likely to be world class at is whatever you obsessed over from, say, age 12 to 18. You know, in my case, it was writing software, uh, where I would think I was good, and then I would meet somebody who would tell me I wasn't, and I would look at their code, and I went through four sort of comeuppances of, oh, that's what a really good programmer looks like. And part of the reason I worshiped digital equipment was eventually it was a couple of their very best programmers who came and shared with me how they thought about it, how they did things. And I had studied their code and, uh, and, that, and there, there were several people who were so key to my doing that. So today I would go into you know, software, which today that means going into artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, computers still can't read. They, they cannot take a book of information and say pass an AP test on that book. And that's a solvable problem, but it's a knowledge representation problem. And, you know, I've always wanted to solve that problem. Uh, I'm jealous that maybe one of you gets to work on that. I'm, you know, unlikely to go back and be hands-on in that, in that way. But it's the juiciest problem. Ever. I've thought about it for a long time. Uh, so I, I would go into AI. Well, Bill, it has been a privilege to have you here for the hour. Please join me in thanking Bill. Great. Come back and visit anytime. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Good luck, good luck on your finals. Uh, you have to send it to me. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you.